Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 547. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's, <clears throat> I completely forget what day of the week it is, but I know it's the 7th of November. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's Wednesday. No, it's Thursday. It will be Wednesday. <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> Okay, before we get too far down the road, we have instructions for you, the faithful viewer, ladies, gentlemen, boys and girls, clerics and laity alike. If you could like the program on Facebook and YouTube, that helps us a lot. If you could share it with your friends or enemies, we don't care, we're not that picky. If you've not subscribed to the program, please click that red rectangle and subscribe. If you want instant notifications, click that little bell and it will pop up on your browser. There's a new episode from Anglican TV, that's us. We've been doing this for many years. We talk about the Anglican news around the world, Christian news around the world, and we have news to talk about today. Before we do that, uh, that is not your normal background, George. Where are you? I am at the uh, rectory of the uh, Church of St. Bartholomew on the island of St. Bartholomew in the French West Indies. Well, that's, how long does it take to get there? Well, you've uh, six hours drive to Fort Lauderdale, three hours flight to St. Martin, then a uh, 10 minute flight and a little puddle jumper to over to St. Barts. That's okay. And uh, you go, you it, even the, you, you see all of the glory of the French bureaucratic mindset at work as you go through customs in St. Ma Martin's and in St. Bart. Seven people on a little airplane take as long as the 747 uh, clearing customs and immigration in St. Bart's as they do in New York City. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> It, it, it's quite fascinating to see the national character at work. Oh, sure. Uh, Gavin, what, what European nation are you in this week? <clears throat> well, I went from a, a week or eight days in Athens, and then I flew back to, uh, to England, and then 48 hours later I came down to Normandy. Uh, and so um, that explains why I don't know what day of the week it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> uh, I'm actually leaving for my destination in two hours. I have to go to Washington, D.C. for our, our annual Dice and Synod, which will be a lot of fun. But uh, we're going to not rush the show, really. We're going we're gonna to just be articulate the first time. And we have plenty of new, <laughs> I know, <laughs> you're surprised as I am. So I'm going to pull up uh, Anglican Inc. here real quick. And I saw there's a, a women priest who says abortionists are saints. Now, uh, Miss Ragsdale has been in the, uh, the news before. This is not a new story. Uh, years ago, she said uh, abortion is a blessing and she did this during a sermon and had her congregates chanting it with her. Uh, she joined the staff of EDS and um, from what I hear, it didn't go well. And uh, I thought, you know, it's an insider story for us. We know it's, oh, same old, same old. But once the press and the Christian press and uh, everybody else gets a hold of it, it's like the first time this has happened again. They're just reliving the Episcopal Wars. So George, what she say this time? Actually, she says nothing this time. It's just <laughs> that the uh, Catholic press, uh, Dwight Long Longenecker and the Church Militant and other uh, traditional Catholic outlets uh, resurrected this story and have splashed it. Now, I don't know whether this is sort of to distract outrage from the, uh, the Pak Chamama stuff, but uh, Catherine Ragsdale has been for 25 years an outspoken abortion activist uh, she once called abortion a sacrament and has led uh, all sorts of stuff she has been uh, an executive director of abortion organizations she was the dean and president of episcopal divinity school and under her tenure the church the seminary collapsed and was sold out and merged into union theological seminary and so it doesn't exist with, after the seminary closed, she was out of job without a job, and so she became the acting president of the National Abortion Federation. And this past month, uh, her appointment was made permanent. So the new news is that her acting position of the last year or so has been made permanent. And when this sort of came across the wires, uh, 
some people just exploded. How could this possibly be? And uh, uh, well, <laughs> it's been that way for a very long time. <laughs> For for many, it's the same old, same old. I want to talk about a, a concept that I think we've talked about two or three times off the air, and that is that the the progressive left is kind of weaning itself out in places like the Episcopal Church, uh, the left of the uh, the Methodist Church, the left of the Lutheran Church. The activists of the '60s, '70s, and '80s are retiring, and the replacements aren't as bad. They're not perfect. But uh, in no way, shape, or form are they the abortion activists, the anti-nuclear activists, the anti-war activists that uh, has been leading the charge in the church since the 70s. Yes, that's true. And you see this with someone like Catherine Ragsdale, who's in her, in her 60s, and uh, she is not, she succeeded, she and her clan, her tribe, have seized the heights of the uh, hierarchy and the establishment in many parts of the church. Well, they've not been able to create a new generation of believers that follow them. So the younger people who, who may be progressive and liberal on a number of issues, when they read about uh, the priests saying this is uh, abortionists or saints and the abortion is a sacrament, they roll their eyes because, you know, they know what nonsense this is. But so it, it's quite fascinating to see that the liberalism is, is really reached, is petering out we saw this at the last Episcopal General Convention when the hard, people who are really hot to mandate gay marriage everywhere at any time in any place were all in their 60s and 70s. And it was the people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s who may be equally uh, liberal in their mindsets who were saying, no, 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 we can't have a church that is coercive. We have to uh, give a bit of breathing space. We have to let everybody get along. So the the fierce revolutionaries uh, of the past are aging, are not aging well, and the revolution is not being carried forward. And the momentum, well, the pendulum, if you will, is ever so slowly starting to move back in the Episcopal Church. Well, we just had Glenn Davies say to the church, to the liberals, go start your own church. Yes. Stop trying to destroy what, what's here. Um, is that something that can be done in England? Uh, Gavin, can they, uh, you just tell the liberals to get out and leave the church to the conservatives? Well, I'm very glad we're having this conversation because um, not because it's refreshing when George and I see two sides of a coin and, and disagree, but because I think by having this conversation, we can try and thrash out what's going on. I'm finding it difficult to understand what's going on. Can I can I take what George has said so far, which is sure, absolutely, absolutely right? And then build on it a little bit. Um, you, in, you said that this has been resurrected by some of the Catholics, uh, either echoing or distracting from the Pacamama debacle. Uh, and they're certainly connected. So the question is, how are they connected? Um, there was a very interesting uh, webcast run by the Spectator magazine in England between uh, Douglas Murray and an American journalist whose name I've forgotten. Um, but but I'm sure you'll know. I'm, I'm sorry. It's one of those names that's got out of my head. And they were asking the question, who's driving this progressive agenda in politics and in culture? And Douglas Murray went for the conspiracy theory. Someone, somewhere, some cabal, some group must be driving it. And uh, the American journalist said, no, no, we, we can't do conspiracy theories. It's just evolving. And I, I don't know the answer to it, but it's certainly evolving. And what the Catholic Church is finding in the whole Pacamama debacle is this emergence of Earth Mother feminism, progressive value seeping into the church. They're certainly being driven by a cabal of people. And I've just finished reading uh, the work of an, a previous Episcopalian priest called Taylor Marshall, whom you probably know much more about than I do, who's written a book, who became a Roman Catholic and wrote a book called Infiltration and traced this progressive movement infiltrating inside the Western Church to the Freemasons of the 1850s. Uh, I, I find all conspiracy theories really problematic to my sanity, but whoever's behind it, it's certainly happening. And so the, the issue seems to be whether or not the Episcopalian Church is managing to kick the progressive pendulum, as George says, maybe that's true. It's certainly not being kicked in outside 
in secular culture, which is bearing in on the church. So the Church of England has capitulated to it almost completely. And now the question is, to what extent does the Roman Catholic Church allow this Trojan horse to take control from within and, and who's driving it and on what side is Pope Francis and how does how does feminism, earth motherhood, uh, worshipping creation and homosexuality all link together because they certainly do in the in the life of uh, um, this lady Raglan. Well I agree because there is a difference between the Marxism, uh, fascism and socialism you see in the church versus what you see in society. In society, the liberal pr professors who are 60s, 70s, and 80s are still there uh, corrupting the minds of the young students, and they come out just completely warped. That is still happening, but I think at the, the Christian church level, we're seeing less um, uh, authority of these people in what they want to carry out, and to a certain extent. I mean, you still have Bill Love, who's, you know, uh, being shown the door, but you don't see a trial yet. Why is that? Well, I just don't think they have the ability to to martyr this guy yet. So, you know, we'll have to see on that. What do you think, George? Uh, you've opened the door to about 10 different questions. Uh, if we, I always if do. We, if we, <laughs> so if it's we, a great show. <laughs> if we look at the Bill Love case, just like the Bob Duncan case and Mark Lawrence, 90% of that was driven by personality. Bob Duncan's case, Mark Lawrence's case, uh, they, they were disliked. And because of personal animosities, decisions were made that came to be regretted privately afterwards. Bill, uh, and so that's why someone like Keith Ackerman, who should have been nailed years before Mark Lawrence or Bob Duncan, was never touched. It was only, he was caught in the undertow after the collapse of good order and discipline and legality under Catherine Jefford Shorey surrounding Bob Duncan. That's when Keith Ackerman was uh, nailed. So part of the issue with, with uh, Bishop Love is that he just does not, he does, he has never been a good team player in the House of Bishops. And so that he's never really been able to build a uh, group of people who just like Bill. Um, and so he's sort of always been on the margins and people on the margins, when you have these wild whipsaw uh, emotional things, they're the ones that get hurt. And I, I have no knowledge as to what will happen to Bill Love. I just know that he's not been his best ally in this fight in, some of the, in the way he's do, done things. Now that's a separate, that's sort of going very deep into the weeds, into the grass on the Bill Love issue. Um, one of the reasons, um, Nick Nicely, the Bishop of Rhode Island is liberal, but he is also a decent, honorable person. And he understands what justice and truth means. So you have someone in charge of that judicial process who will take seriously the issues that are raised in Love's defense. Now, the problem is, is Bishop Love going to raise these issues in his defense or is he going to do, uh, is he going to choose martyrdom and provoke expulsion as did Mark Lawrence and Bob Duncan. So th that's a different issue. Now, as to the greater issue, um, I, well, I've never been impressed by the author. Uh, I don't want to name names, but the man Gavin mentioned is uh, not somebody who I would uh, uh, praise a great deal of uh, analytical insight in. Um, no, there's not a secret cabal it's if you will there's more of a spirit of the age whenever i hear freemasons are behind something <laughs> yeah. uh, i just start I take to, my freemason ring off and go what yeah. <laughs> um in other words it it's the same sort of thing uh, we've seen these books by from roman catholic you know starting with people like malachi martin in the 70s with the whole exorcism demonism stuff well malachi martin was a sexual predator and he's writing about his battles with demons and he was involved in it too, but in a different level. So you've got to, you, this, the, the spirit of the age, I think, what is more of a, uh, 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 is, is a better describer in my experience than the actual activities of certain individuals. Because at the end of the day, they're not that many competent people at the top of the Episcopal Church. Yeah, if I, I so completely agree. 
if you if I agree you want to be, completely, George. You know, the Episcopal <laughs> Church does its very best to make sure mediocre people rise to the top. And so there's not a grand, oh, what's his name? Oh, the Da Vinci Code author, Dan Brown. There's no Dan, Dan Brown. Brown. Sure. There's, <laughs> there are no albino members of Opus Day in the Episcopal <laughs> Church uh, causing all this I, to happen. I think there's two best arguments against conspiracy. Our festival, as you quite rightly say, they take an enormous amount of intelligence and energy and competence to, to, to carry off, and we don't see those qualities around in people. And the other thing is they're very bad for your mental health. So I, I'm, with, I'm with George completely here in wanting to ascribe it to the spirit of the age. But having done that, it doesn't make what we're dealing with any less potent um, in fact, in a way, it makes it more difficult because instead of being able to trace it back to people, we can have conversations confront and expose. We're dealing with something considerably more amorphous and I think probably much more akin to what St. Paul was talking about when he described our struggle being with principalities and powers. However, let's assume it's the spirit of the age. It's still manifesting itself, turbocharged, in different churches at different rates with different levels of success and and i think can only be confronted by prayer holiness and scriptural scriptural insight one of the uh now this may strike our uh, viewers as being particularly crazy but i liken the sort of situation within the in the anglican world to the situation in germany in the 30s and 40s adolf hitler was a mesmerizing speaker but it was actually the bureaucracy. It was the German, the, the, the Wilhelmine, the Weimar, the regular old judges, bureaucrats, officers who put into place Hitler's wild ideas. And Hitler, actually, there's several, uh, the study, this, the research has found that Hitler from time to time was pleasantly surprised that the, the state would actually put into process some of his more fantastical ideas, like the extermination of the Jews. So that I'm not, now, I'm not exonerating Adolf Hitler, far from it. I mean, but the point being is that you you need to distinguish between an orator and rhetoric and uh, just sort of the, the wild spirit that can be out there. But then what are the mechanisms, the bureaucratic mechanisms that build institutions to carry out the evil that may be floating out there? It's not well, that Justin Welby is a bad is is a modern Hitler or anything like, like that, but rather the bureaucratic mechanisms, the establishment, how bishops are chosen, how clergy are selected, how they're trained, the people at the le lower levels who may not be brilliant, they may not be masterminds, but they get a, a steer from the rhetoric of the people at, who are leading the show. And then they implement that in their own little ways and each little iteration of that, uh, you know, starting in seminary, we're studying the Bible. You know, at Episcopal Divinity School was famous that you could graduate with a degree of Master of Divinity and not take a single course in the Bible. I mean, and if you start at sort of those little things and then you go through the system that way, eventually by the time you come out, you're either totally warped or totally unprepared and you just latch on to whatever's free floating out there. Well, one of the biggest issues we have is our education system worldwide. We are teaching children and young adults there is no truth. And that is completely warping to individuals. And the church is not counterpointing it. You don't see the Anglican Church, you don't see the Roman Catholic Church, Lutherans, Methodists, say, no, no, there is truth, and we have good catechism. Come in here, fill our doors. Um, fill our sanctuaries will tell you the truth there just doesn't seem to be a counterpoint to what's warping them in the culture i think that's one of the most important things we could say in this broadcast there's a i read on twitter today of a canadian high school where a girl in the choir was told she had to wear a rainbow colored poppy for remembrance day and when she said she didn't want to she was uh, she was ejected from the choir on the grounds of a hateful attitude. Now, this may just be some ridiculous uh, explosion of cultural contortion that the Canadians in particular are, are capable of, but, the, but there doesn't seem to be any pushback from the church holding secular counter, culture to account in any way. And one of the things I think is most difficult is the way in which the church has, has slowly but surely gone along with 
progressive utopianism. Now, George, I'm sure, is right, and, and uh, Freemasons are being credited with much too much. But nonetheless, the spirit, the intellectual spirit, the, the, the Aryan alternative to Christianity has been, we can make this world a place of fairness, justice, beauty, and truth. And if you take scripture seriously, you can't, because this is where the devil was thrown down and human beings in their flawed nature are incapable of these things. But so many people within the church want to buy in to this new ideology that's been particularly around since the French Revolution and believe we have the power to remake humans and remake society. At this point, the church really should be saying, actually, we believe in the fall and we believe in salvation by Jesus. You can't do that. That's the kickback, I think, Kevin, that we should be looking for and articulating. In, in, there was an American domestic news item that I think speaks to this directly, where uh, Joe Biden, who's the running for president of the United States, mm. is the leading Democratic candidate. He's a Roman Catholic. He, uh, he attended a Catholic service in South Carolina, and the priest declined to give him communion because of his outspoken attitudes in a, on abortion. And this made its way into the press. And Cardinal Dolan of New York and, and Biden's Bishop uh, Maloney of Wilmington, Delaware, both said that the Catholic priest in South Carolina was wrong for repelling Biden from the communion rail, even though the rules of the Catholic Church, which the bishop in South Carolina said you must uphold to his clergy, say that if you are an abortion advocating uh, politician, you may not receive at the communion rail. But if you're Cardinal of New York, uh, you can say, oh, well, we're going to give Joe Biden a pass because he's Joe Biden. Well, let's go a step further. Joe Biden said the Pope gives him communion. It's yeah. not just the Cardinal. It's not just, you know, uh, up there. anybody in authority in the Catholic Church can make that sh that uh, change beyond the policy. Well, here's the thing, that, that, that there are some authorities, the priest, the diocesan bishop in Charleston, South Carolina, who have stood firm by the rules and the unchanging faith. And then there are others, the Cardinal Archbishop of New York, or and even Pope Francis, who are captured by the spirit of the age. It's a, and we had that, that's the issue that it's been in the Episcopal Church, though it was started 25 years ago. And now we're seeing those same sort of things happen in the Catholic Church as we experience in the Episcopal Church. And, either, I don't, I don't and, and the result in the Episcopal Church has been the ghettoization of little uh, little islands of orthodoxy in an otherwise uh, oh, tempestuous heterodox sea. Well, this is the thing that's been driving me intellectually, um, if I can use that pretentious word, theologically, for the last 10 years. And that is that churches that have defined themselves by their attitudes to a cultural struggle that took place 500 years ago are a long way behind the curve because there's a cultural struggle that's taking place today. And actually, it's uniform across the churches. We're, we're all struggling with the spirit of the age, which is corrupting and uh, anti-scripture, indeed anti-Christ. And one of the things we ought to be doing, I think, is to have a far keener sense of the way in which Orthodox Christians across the denominations ought to be able to watch each other's backs in the face of this slow but steady diminution of faith driven by the spirit of the age. So, George, I think that's a brilliant example, and, and that, you know, that really nails what we're talking about. I would like to ask both of you, is the Pocky Mama story ever going to die? Uh, we're a week out, and uh, it's still, if I'm watching Catholic news sources, liberal or conservative or militant, um, it's still the story of the day, um, having these idols uh, presented at a synod and, and worshipped with. And I'm like, well, this this just must be the, the final straw on the camel's back because uh, this story is not dying in my mind, or it's just a bored press. Is the press so bored no, no, they can't I, think of anything else? I don't think it's going to die at all. This is this is the this is the jemmy in the door. This is the means by which conspiracy or not, uh, the the group of people pushing Vatican II. And at this point, George is right again. This is a group of people in their sixties, seventies, and eighties who are sold on liberation theology and Marxist politics from the seventies who very badly want to implement their views within, in this case, the Catholic Church. And they've chosen the indigenous interests of Amazonians. And this whole theological 
uh, argument between enculturation and conversion. They've chosen this to be the battleground by which to do it. So it's simply the latest arena in which these ideas uh, are, are conflicting. And basically, it seems to me, it's, it's conversion of the kingdom of heaven versus enculturation and political utopianism. Um, that's where, it, but it, it's broken out there. It will continue to break out in every part of the church from time to time. In South America, the Pachimama uh, issue, I think, is going to be fatal. Uh, I'll tell you why. Um, politically, Argentina has just elected a new Peronist government. Exactly. Chile is undergoing social unrest. Bolivia is undergoing social unrest. Venezuela, uh, eight dollars a day is the average. Eight dollars is the average monthly wage. Ninety percent of the people live in abject poverty. poverty. Yeah. Nicaragua, uh, the commun the guerrillas are coming back. Uh, are going back up into the mountains in Colombia. The entire continent, save for Brazil, is engaged in a battle between leftist elites and the people, the, the poor and the middle classes and those, their rising uh, financial uh, uh, aspirations. And the Catholic Church in each, uh, in the only place that is sort of the outlier is Brazil, where they have elected a person very much like Donald Trump. And the Catholic Church in Brazil has thrown themselves, as is the Anglican Episcopal Church of Brazil, have thrown themselves firmly in the leftist socialist liberation theology camp. And you have places in like Bolivia and Argentina and Chile where the church is on the side of the less leftist establishment elites and have lost uh, the sympathy, the contact with the masses of people. So that the results of, and when I say it's fatal, I'll, I'll give Brazil as an example. Uh, in 1960, over 95% of the people were Roman Catholic. Today, Brazil is a majority Protestant country. And that will only uh, increase, not decrease, because the Catholic Church is hemorrhaging people because its leadership at the time of Vatican II took Vatican II and ran with it. and. Bishop Erwin Krautler, one of the Synod Fathers, a retired, he's an Austrian, he was a bishop in the Amazonian jungle. Uh, he was the one who people would take photos of him walking hand in hand with his girlfriend around Rome, oh, isn't this fun, ha, ha, ha. Krautler made a statement from the dais saying that as a bishop, he never baptized a single Indian <clears throat> because to baptize them would be offensive to their uh, cultural heritage. Now. Evil is real. What Pacamama represents is real. And for many Christians in South America, and in Brazil in particular, what these symbolize are the forces of darkness and evil and the devil. There's no attempt to spin this into a localized version of the Virgin Mary. And what this means is that when you have radical Protestant ministers get up and say, see, we told you so, the Catholic Church really are heathens and idolaters who have corrupted the Bible and so forth. They point to Pacamama, and then they have the Brazilian hierarchy saying, "Oh, well, we should allow we should allow Indians to continue to expose their children when they're born if they have birth of cleft palates. We should not criticize cannibalism because it's just the way they do that. People aren't stupid, and the Catholic well, Church has, has <clears throat> and at least in that part of the world has taken well, that's one their, of the reasons ideology why forward." It's one of the reasons why that video of that young Austrian bourgeois uh, professional sweeping the Pacamama idols from the bridge into the River Tiber w was s greeted with such enormous popularity. There is indeed a huge number of young clergy who are absolutely uh, devoted to traditional Christianity in and against this liberalism. Although, interestingly enough, George, if we're going to move politically, which is a direction which I'm very hesitant to go, but there's a very, a very real possibility that the United Kingdom will follow South America in terms of uh, if, if Corbyn wins this next election, the level of borrowing he wants to bring us to is quite, is quite Venezuelan. And once again, you, as you described it, the church, the establishment, has, has identified itself completely with the, the left political agenda. So we, we have these, this, this bifurcated polit political agenda and spiritual agenda which line up and match each other. I, I'm just looking at my watch and calendar here. November 7th, uh, 20... You guys haven't Brexited yet? 
<laughs> oh, you're so cruel, uh, Kevin. <laughs> oh, no, no, I'm just saying it was supposed to happen like a dozen times already. What's going on? I was so hoping that, that, that on October the 30th, uh, Johnson would say, actually, guys, we're leaving with the hard Brexit. The, 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 and he didn't. Um, uh, but we have this enormously important election, which people are saying, I think quite rightly, is the most important since 1945, partly, again, because uh, it straddles the spiritual, ethical, political issues that, that we've been discussing. And um, if, if, the, if, the center, if the center wins, because it's not right wing at all, but if, the, if the common sense economical and political center win under Boris Johnson, we live to fight another day. Uh, if if the hard and in our case communist left win, well, it, I mean, gosh, um, well, we will yeah, make Venezuela look like you a have picnic. Johnson Johnson <laughs> versus one of the most populist uh, anti semites in the last uh, two generations. You know, I and that's just from my reading outside the the lines of. Uh, this character and it, it's not it's not dissimilar to trump either there's very little to make johnson personally attractive in the same way there was very little to make trump personally attractive but it just so happens that this rather unattractive buffoon stands is the only thing that stands between us and communism i mean hillary may you know hillary may not have been out overtly communist but certainly the progressive politics she represented are not very far away from what we're facing but in our case it's even more clearly articulated uh, the anti-Semitic, the, the, the Jew-hating, uh, economically disastrous socialist communist program that Corbyn represents. If, 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 if they win because people don't vote strategically over Brexit, um, then really we will we'll make Venezuela look like a sensible democracy. One of the things that, uh, I forget his name, but I think the Labour... Uh Treasury spokesman said that they would start implementing exchange controls, uh, foreign exchange controls, as you had in the uh, 50s to prevent yeah, capital right. flight. Because what will happen if the if a Corbyn your Labour government comes in, people who have money will shift it, and they're going to and they, they're going to send it to the United States. Uh, we're seeing this right now in Hong Kong. Now you know you know interest rates internationally are like one percent, or in Europe they're negative interest rates. The major Hong Kong banks, Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, uh, for example, or uh, Bank of China, are offering CDs paying 7 to 11% on seven-day wow. funds of U.S. and Australian dollars. Why? Because the middle class and the upper classes in Hong Kong are shipping every penny they can out of the country mm -hmm. because they know the end is near. And they, if they can get out, they want their money to be there when they get out. And so what does this mean in the long term? Actually, if Corbyn is elected, it means a boon for the U.S. stock market because the British investors, if they can, will sell General Electric, the U.K. company, and buy General Electric, the American company, because their assets are safer and out of the labor's hands. So the British... I, Unless I, Senator I Warren is elected and then uh, her taxation will cause ruin and people like me who have vast assets We'll move them to Costa Rica, Hong Kong, or other places. Not that, to Hong uh, Kong, Kevin. Don't sorry. Not, to, don't go to Hong Kong. Uh, but <laughs> with, well, actually, well, actually it, no. It, it would be to, say, I, I, my the people I talk to have money in Hong Kong because it is safer than America. If Warren comes in, well, if Warren comes in, then we can blame the Freemasons because that's yes, like yeah, the, I will blame the Freemasons the for the, her election because. Her, the, uh, uh, my goodness. Now, if, if you have the, here's a funny thing, and people don't like to talk about this, but uh, Bernie Sanders, uh, Elizabeth Warren, and Pete Buttigieg have all one thing in common. African Americans don't vote for them. They don't like them. That's why Joe That's right. Biden is doing so well. And if Biden drops out eventually, where's the black vote going to go? Is it going to go to Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders or Pete Buttigieg? No, it's going to stay home. So, friend, I would rate the chances of, of Elizabeth Warren being elected as nearly zero. Uh, we're looking at a McGovern-type blowout in the in the 2020 election unless things change. Mm -hmm. well, 
That's what you watch Unscripted for. Not just <laughs> religious ideas, but uh, the news yeah, from the political advice, world. Investment political <laughs> prognication, <laughs> yeah, social and political analysis. Uh, yep, yep. All right, well, guys. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, out of my, I'm out of my depth on the economic issues. I, I know that. But for me, the right-left thing as a Christian is going to come down to the very most serious issue of freedom of speech. One of the reasons why the left is so dangerous to the church is because they, unlike the center or the right, uh, are determined to, to silence people who want to articulate the gospel and ethical values. And, and, and whether you're rich or poor economically, uh, that's something all Christians ought to be able to unite around. Yeah, no dissent allowed. That's the new uh, goal, not the new, it's always been the goal of liberalism. Uh, you, they, they will offer you here, we want to change the rules and you're allowed to have a different opinion and stuff like that, no big deal. But that's just, that's the capture. Once they capture you, they change that rule. By the way, you're not allowed to disagree with us anymore unless you want to be incarcerated. 1984. Well, it happens. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to us pontificate during Anglican Unscripted episode 547. God bless you. Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. Norma Paki Mama. <laughs>